I guess the reason why I chose such a title is because I'm, I'm really concerned about some of these things that I'm gonna talk about briefly, and I think that you guys should be too. Um, I don't have answers. I have some suggestions about what we could do differently, but you know, I'm just one person. I could be wrong. Uh, I think this is something that we all have together to, to, to together uh, start thinking more seriously about. Uh, so with that, I'm, I'm first gonna mention that um, I, uh, I am the, I guess with Martin Odersky, the co-founder of the Scala Center at EPFL. I'm also, uh, you know, doing Hatsutati professor stuff at, uh, at Northeastern University. Um, but the Scala Center thing is kind of where I ended up obtaining some of these insights from. And uh, if you don't know about the Scala Center, it is a non-for-profit center that uh, we established at EPFL, which is the university that Scala kind of came out of. Um, and uh, this, this Scala Center thing, uh, it's all about somehow better sustaining Scala. So if there's some sort of interesting or important library or a tool that needs to be developed or maintained, uh, if there's some sort of teaching that needs to be done, uh, the Scala Center sort of aims to sort of fill, fill those gaps and to do those things for the community. Um, and I mean, just to give you a quick rundown of the, the sorts of things that we do, uh, we are fully independent from any entity. We get funding from companies, but no company you know, dictates to us that we have to do this or else. Um, so, you know, a major goal of the Scala Center is to independently guide and support the entire community, the entire Scala community, that is. Uh, and of course, like I said, to coordinate and develop uh, libraries and tools uh, that should be generally useful for the whole community. And of course, to do uh, any sort, sort, different sorts of educational activities for Scala. Uh, ideally, stuff that is, is of course, free, oops, freely available. Oh no, I just got caught. Ah. All right. Um, so with that, this, just wanted to, to sort of say, like, this is where I come from uh, with this whole argument. And uh, I, I've, I've got some, some data points here. Some of you have seen some of them. There's some new ones in here. Um, but I like to start this with, with a riddle. Uh, and the first is, well, what does, what does a sidewalk have to do with Scala or open source? Um, or, a, or like a, you know, one of these zebra stripe thingies, like these, these walking, these crosswalks. Uh, this is maybe more, more obvious. What does a bridge have to do with open source? Uh, and the answer is that these things are all examples of shared uh, common physical infrastructure and anybody can pick these things up. Well, maybe you can't pick up a bridge, but you can use them. Uh, there's no reason why you, know, you shouldn't be crossing a bridge, right? Um, and, and the same is true for digital infrastructure, right? There are all of these things that we take for granted that we use every day that we've come to just expect as digital infrastructure that will always be there for us. Um, I'm gonna, throughout the talk, I know I've, I've upset like, people by, <laughs> by uh, freely using different, different groups of terminology. I, I, I'm gonna say floss, and when I say floss, I might mean, you know, I, I always mean this, this uh, you know, indiscriminate group of things that refer to either free or libre and open source software, so the whole category. Um, and, and so when I say floss, that's what I mean. If I, sometimes I say open source, I still also mean this. Um, so I'd like to point out that uh, you know, floss or open source, you can think of that as our, our shared digital infrastructure. Um, anybody can use these things, we generally do, and like I said, a lot of us don't really even realize that they're there because we've just come to expect them. Uh, and you know, there's, it's, you know, I, I come from the Scala world, but there's, there's lots of, uh, uh, you know, lots more examples, right? These are just a few. And so if we go back to that whole physical infrastructure analogy and, and you have uh, you know, a big hole that opens up in the, in the sidewalk or the, the road in front of your house, um, well, this is your, this is your, this is your physical infrastructure and you know, now you can't get to work because you know, the, the <laughs> you'll fall into a bottomless pit in front of your house. So there's gotta be a, a way to fix this, right? Uh, well, in the real world, you, what you do is you, you know, okay, this is like the cool digital way to do it nowadays. Some cities have these like report problems with something in your city app. Uh, but, you know, you observe, hey, there's something wrong here. Can somebody come and fix it? The local government, you know, is like, all right, there's a big hole in front of that guy's house. Let's fix it. And, you know, eventually it gets fixed and then, you know, we continue on with life. Uh, you know, you also pay taxes to make sure that this all gets done. And, you know, we've kind of come to accept that this should work. 
Uh, but if the same thing happens to, you know, whatever important thing that you've been using for the last 10 years, you've got a, a figurative giant hole that opens up in your digital infrastructure, there's nothing you can exactly do about it aside for hope that somebody's going to issue a patch and then you can apply it, right? I mean, I guess, you know, if you really want to get into the internals of some very complicated cryptogric crypt uh, cryptographic thing, maybe you can try to fix it yourself. But, you know, I don't know, maybe that's not your bag. Maybe you can't, right? So uh, you, there's nothing you can really do. Maybe you can open a ticket, hope somebody will answer it, it's different, right? You're not paying taxes to some government that has the obligation to fix the hole in front of your house and like allow you to get out of your house, right? So we don't have this, this sort of centralized entity that we can go to to ask for help when something breaks or something goes wrong. Um, and uh, so on that note, before I get into a bunch of data points I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna let you know that I got a bunch of them out of this um, really great report. If you haven't read it, you should. It's called Roads, Roads and Bridges. It's by um, Nadia Eggball, who now works at GitHub. She did this as a, as a for, she spent a year doing, I think it was a Ford Fellowship, trying to understand, uh, you know, the ways in which, you know, as a society, we depend on this sort of digital infrastructure, sort of the problems with it, the good things about it. And there's a lot of information and interviews that she's kind of, uh, you know, built up and put into this report. So there's a bunch of, uh, I take, uh, you know, I, I will cite it as I go when I take information from there. And if the information doesn't come from that report, I have links at the bottom of the slides. I've also uploaded the slides. So if you want any of these references, uh, you'll, you'll be able to have them if, if you download the slide deck. Okay, but on that note, uh, okay, so, so I don't know if you remember this whole, this whole, these days when people were going around, um, like, like salesmen selling, hey, you should use open source software instead of, uh, instead of something proprietary. You know, use, uh, you know, don't use Microsoft Word. Uh, use one of the, you know, the LibreOffice choices, right? Uh, don't do, don't use uh, proprietary things when you build uh, new, new software stacks. Um, that was actually, so I, I argue that that was before. <laughs> because now, actually, everybody is jumping onto this whole floss bandwagon. Um, and, and I hope that, you know, by the time I get through this talk, you're going to be convinced that we actually don't need to, con uh, to encourage people to use open source software. Uh, in fact, people actually just use it a lot. And instead, we have a different problem, and that is uh, how do we make open source more sustainable, or how do we, so in some way, uh, encourage people to give back to that open source software that they're using. Um, so there's this company um, called Black Duck uh, that runs, has, for the last, I think, 11 years, I think they're up to year 11 now, uh, they've run these surveys about the uh, sort of health and sort of, you know, spread and impact of open source. Um, and, and it's, it's, you know, they, they, they have quite a, 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 far, a far reach. So in 2016, they interviewed 1,300 different companies. And in 2015, that, w that number was 1,200. Um, and in these, in these, I mean, they ask different sets of questions each, each year. It's not the same questions. Uh, but what, what they found uh, was that in 2015, they, they, they found that uh, of those 1,200 co uh, companies that they had went out and said, hey, you know, tell us about the open source software that you use, 78% uh, of those companies say that they run on open source software. And uh, this is actually up... Uh, more than, or well, it's up two times since 2010. In 2010, that number was only 35% when they asked the same question. So here you have in five years, uh, now basically 80% of people are using open source software. Five years earlier, only what, 30%, 35% were. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the trend is that more and more companies are, are depending on, on open source software. Uh, and, you know, it's perhaps something that if you're just a consumer, you're not contributing to open source software, you can't see this happening necessarily. Um, also in this survey, they had reasons. They asked, these, they asked uh, the, the respondents of the survey, hey, why are you actually using, why, why did you decide to go with open source software rather than some sort of proprietary solution? And the reasons uh, that, that uh, sort of the, the top ranked reasons were actually quality the quality of solutions. I thought that it would actually be the number three reason here, which is the ability to customize and fix a piece of software. If there's something that's not correct, uh, you can fix a bug or you can add a feature and maybe they'll accept it up upstream or at least you can maintain a fork, whatever. I thought number three would be the most important thing, but it turns out that uh, essentially all of these companies that were surveyed, it's so like 80% of them said that the, the open source solution was a, of higher quality than either the proprietary or uh, solution that they come up with in-house, which 
was a big surprise to me. And then uh, sort of in step with that is sort of the fact that uh, features were competitive uh, and then, you know, maybe, you know, things were faster, things were able to be benchmarked. So it's kind of in, in line with the, the quality of solutions point. Um, and also something that's, uh, that's super surprising to me in 2015, uh, they, they also asked, well, all right, if you're going to have to uh, decide, you know, on a, on a piece of software to use in your stack, uh, what would you go for? Would you go for something that's proprietary or would you go for something that's open source? Uh, and 66% of these companies in 2015 answered, "Hey, we're not even looking at open. Uh, we're not even looking at proprietary software. We just reach for something uh, in, in the open source realm first. So at this point, uh, a majority of people aren't even considering proprietary solutions, which is, you know, a, a massive shift. It's a massive change. I think at this point, you can say that open source is, has basically won. In the 2017 survey, this is the last data point from these surveys. I'm going to show you." 60% um, of the companies that they had surveyed said that they use more open source software this year than last year. They've added more things to their stack. So that's also kind of horrifying. It's not even that uh, more companies are doing it. The companies that were doing it are doing it more, right? <laughs> uh, and th you know, this, this year, the main reason that they said that, the, you know, that open source was better was because it was low cost. It was free, right? At least they don't have to pay for it. Somebody else does somehow, right? Uh, and there's no vendor lock-in, so that's also good. So, you know, these are some of the, the, the insights that you can, you can kind of call out of this survey. Um, other data points. Uh, so there's a, an entrepreneur named Mark Suster who uh, was a part of, you know, a, you know a software companies in the 90s. Uh, and back then, when he built his first company, he said it cost him $2.5 million just in sort of proprietary infrastructure to get started. Uh, to build his product on top of, and then another $2.5 million in, in team costs, you know, the, the people costs to build the thing on top of the proprietary infrastructure, uh, and then to manage, market, sell, everything. Uh, and suddenly, you know, you have this open source option, uh, and infrastructure was now free, essentially free. Uh, instead of paying for the actual software, you pay 10% of the price for maybe a support contract or for some contracting help, something like this. So suddenly, you know, his, his argument is that you, here you have a 90% disruption in the cost. Uh, so, you know, and surely, uh, you know, you're going to have business going in that direction if you've got such a, a big uh, price motivator to go away from these proprietary things, right? Uh, another, another, co another founder of a well-known startup, uh, Mark Krieger, he is the co-founder of, of, um, of Instagram. And he wrote a blog article uh, about, you know, sort of, you know, giving advice to other other founders of a tech of tech startups, and the the advice is, you know, very very strongly, borrow instead of building new things. Just if you can find something that will do what you need it to do, use that before you build something in house. He says there are hundreds of fantastic open source projects that have been built through the hard experience of creating and scaling companies, especially around infrastructure and monitoring. That can save you time and let you focus on actually building out your product. I guess that's true, right? I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that. Um, so Nadia wrote a blog article after, sometime after, after the acquisition of, of Instagram. And I, I'm not going to like defend the calculations in this article. All I'm going to, to say is just going to restate her, her conclusion. Uh, and, you know, Nadia argues that based on the, the open source software that they include in the Instagram app itself, uh, that you could attest 1.40, I'm sorry, $143 million of Instagram's $1 billion acquisition on, on software that they didn't write. <laughs> I mean, if that's the percentage of the software that's inside of this, this app that then, uh, you know, it gets acquired, right? So this is her argument, whether it's true, I don't know, but that's a, that's a lot of value that you just get, you know, on GitHub for free. Uh, so you have all of these people, uh, you know, famous, famous VCs, famous uh, co-founders of startups, et cetera, giving general advice to the whole universe saying, hey, don't build anything if you don't have to. Reuse things that already exist. They're already out there for free for you to use. Just jump on it and then build your company on top of that. 
right? And then, you know, we've got all these aggregate statistics about how industry is actually doing that. It doesn't have to be startups. It's, uh, I could show you uh, some of the, like, sort of the breakdowns of the different industries that, that these companies are coming from where they're using open source. It's literally everything. Education, government, 100% of, of industries that we interact with as humans, they're building on open source software, right? Uh, but at the same time, it's not like, you know, so we have this, like, asymptoting of users, uh, but we're not seeing the same trend with the people who are building this, right? Uh, and so in, um, I mean, I'm, we all know this, this famous example. In 2014, uh, there was a heart bleed that happened. Um, so at the time, two-thirds of all web servers were using OpenSSL, uh, and, uh, you know, while that's the case, well, literally, you know, every web server has OpenSSL, uh, it turned out that the people that were actually maintaining OpenSSL was, actually, I think it was like one quarter of a developer uh, <laughs> at, any, at any moment. Uh, so there was one, one guy named Steve Marcus uh, who, who was not sort of like the main guy that was contributing. He was just sort of every now and then casually helping out, I guess. Uh, he noticed that another contributor named Steve Henson, or Stephen Henson, uh, was actually working often full times, uh, full time on OpenSSL for you know bursts at a time, and um, Steve Marcus was kind of you know curious how that financially could work out. How could you how could you do that? Uh, and he found out that actually he was extremely shocked to find that uh, that Henson actually uh, only only made a little bit of money here and there for contracting gigs, uh, and he basically made uh, you know one fifth of, of Marcus's salary and was kind of in poverty. And uh, at the time when Marcus had discovered this, he, he uh, you know, he, he looked at, at this, this other developer, Stephen Henson, who he thought was a much stronger developer than him. And here he was, uh, basically not, not getting paid for all the work that he does. Um, and this is a quote uh, he, he said of this whole ordeal, was that uh, he had always assumed, as had the rest of the world, that the OpenSSL team was large, active, and well-resourced. Uh, but in reality, uh, like I said, OpenSSL wasn't bringing in enough money to even support a single person's uh, job or, you know, efforts. And yet, here we are, everything that we're doing, industry, government, etc., uh, they don't have any, any idea that these kinds of things are happening. But we're just building stuff on top of that, which is a little, a little scary, I think. Um, so yeah, I, I, I have, I've got to read you a couple of quotes because it's, it's way better to hear it from the people than to try and paraphrase. Um, but, you know, of this, again, Steve Marcus said, uh, you know, I'm looking at you, Fortune 1000 companies, the ones who include OpenSSL in your firewall, appliance, cloud, financial security products that you sell for profit and, and or who use it to secure your internal infrastructure and communications the ones who don't have to fund an in-house team of programmers to wrangle crypto code, and then who nag us for free consulting services when you can't figure out how to use it. The ones who have never lifted a finger to contribute to the open source community that gave you this gift. You know who you are. As you can see, he's not pleased about the situation, but it is a pretty harrowing, uh, you know, arrangement, right? So I'm, I'm a bit scared by this whole thing. Uh, and so I found some more data points. Um, so this, this comes from a university, uh, a research group in Brazil that uh, is a software engineering research group in Brazil. They came up with a way to calculate the truck factor based on a code base. Um, and uh, what they did was they took that, that way of calculating truck factor. So if, you, if you've not heard of truck factor, the truck factor is uh, the minimal number of developers that have to be hit by a truck or quit. You can choose the, how nice you want to make it. Uh, before a project is totally incapacitated and kind of dies, right? Um, and so they, they took this way that they developed of, of calculating uh, the truck factor, and then they looked at uh, the most popular, or I'm sorry, the most active projects on GitHub, and then they basically applied their calculation to those, those repositories, and they found that 64% uh, of those 133 most active projects had only one or two developers that they needed to, to exist. Um, I'm not, you don't have to read this, it's the, it's just, the, the effect is, is what I'd like you to sort of internalize here. So this is, these are the results. Um, the higher the truck factor, the better. So of course we want our, our repositories to be in the very bottom of this, of this uh, table here. Um, and the, the rows correspond to truck factors. So the thing that's uh, in orange here, this orange box, 
uh, that's, that's, that's labeled TF, this is the truck factor for different repositories. So as you can see, most of them are concentrated into truck factor one and two, like those two rows. Um, and I know you can't read any of this. Um, first, I'm going, to, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you sort of some, some things that you would be shocked to find are truck factor one and two. So it turns out that grunt, if you use grunt and SAS, these are truck factor one. Uh, reactive extensions, truck factor one. Apparently, uh, WordPress's command line tools also truck factor one. Uh, I, I guess this one is not so surprising. If you guys use D3, truck factor one. If you've ever looked at the code base, it's, it's I, you know, I guess I understand. But truck factor one, and everybody uses it for visualizations, like every visualization library is built on it. Truck factor two is Apache Cassandra, uh, closure. Anybody a Clojure programmer in here? I guess you guys know that if you're a Clojure developer. Um, Python pandas. That's a big one. A lot of people use that one. Netty, truck factor two. And I'm going to read you just a couple more um, in, in sort of the truck factor three and four boxes. So uh, jQuery apparently is truck factor four. That's not a super good number. Um, WordPress is truck factor five. Ruby, truck factor five. IPython, truck factor four. Mm, what else? Gradle, truck factor four. Jo Jekyll, truck factor four. So these are all some pretty, you know, recognizable names. And uh, the main argument here is that there are just a few people keeping those code bases alive. And I really hope that they're not like Stephen Henson's, <laughs> right? That would be really bad. Um, but it's not all bad. Uh, there are also or tools and, and, and frameworks and libraries and things and, that have high truck factors too. Uh, the highest is Linux. I guess that's good. Uh, Homebrew, but that's kind of cheating because you make a pull request with your whatever. But Homebrew. Um, and you know, there are just a few others. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have to read them all. V8 is truck factor 14. Guess so, it makes sense. Google is paying for it, right? Um, free BSD, okay. There's a bunch of things that have higher truck factors. So that's good, it's not, it's not all bad. It's just surprising what has a low truck factor and how much we need it. That's, that's what's bad. Um, and if you're curious, I wanted, so I, I, I had some issues plugging in my laptop. I wanted to like interactively look at the truck factors of some popular libraries with you, but because I, I cannot use my laptop, I, I can't pull this up, so I'm just gonna let you guys do this offline. There's a website called gettrends.io and this is from the research group that developed this sort of calculation of the truck factor, and they went and applied this calculation to uh, not every GitHub repository, but a lot. So you can search around in this repository and see, you know, cho choose, choose a software project that you like. It's probably in here. You can see what the truck factor is. Um, okay, so truck factors are low. Lots of people are using this. More and more people are using the, these open source projects. Um, and then we have this, you know, situation with, uh, you know, maintainers like Stephen Henson, the guy that did most of the work for OpenSSL, right? Um, you're gonna bear with me, you have to bear with me, because this is when I'm gonna read you a bunch of quotes from stressed out maintainers. Again, I can't, I can't paraphrase it better than reading you their own words. Um, so Noah Kantrowitz, uh, who is a, a, a member of the Python Software Foundation, uh, you know, characterize this, this shift in the number of users sort of increasing and uh, the number of maintainers or contributors not exactly increasing with it. He, he said, in the early days of op the open source movement, there were relatively few projects, and in general, most people using a project were also contributing back to it in some way. Both of these things have changed by likely uncountable orders of magnitude. Uh, the, uh, the other problem is the growing imbalance between producers and consumers. In the past, these were roughly in balance. People put time and effort into the commons and everyone reaped the benefits. These days, very few people put in that effort and a vast majority simply benefit from those that do. This imbalance has become so ingrained that for a company to repay in either time or money, even a small fraction of the value that they derive from the commons is almost unthinkable. So we've developed a culture of reaping the benefits but not sort of putting in uh, any effort to sort of keep the commons uh, as it is. Uh, so there are a lot of famous examples of, uh, you know, important contributors rage quitting. Um, I'm not going to read the, some of the colorful examples, uh, but there was a contributor named Ryan Big 
who wrote uh, documentation for Ruby on Rails and announced that he was quitting all open source work. I do not have the time or energy to invest in open source anymore. I'm not being paid at all to do any open source work. And so the work that I do uh, it, there is the time that I could be spending doing life stuff or writing. It's not fair to expect me to do even more work outside of my regular work and then not get fairly compensated time or money for it. It's a great recipe as well for burnout and making me just generally grumpy. Um, an engineering manager at a, at a web agency had a, a similar experience. Um, he says, well, that's the big thing for me, knowing you did something for free out of love and there's an endless stream of people going more, more, more and getting angry when you won't accommodate their edge case. I had my phone number on one of my personal sites so friends could get in touch with me. I had to take it down after a week because people would call me in the middle of the day for plug-in support, even though there's a forum for support. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. It just wears you down, makes you afraid to check your email or answer the phone. That's bad. And people get burned out. Um, it's not a secret. I'm sure you've... Uh, met somebody in one of your various communities that has experienced some kind of burnout before. Uh, and, you know, with this, this dynamic, these dynamics shifting the way that they are, uh, you know, that's a really bad thing because we have more and more users and not exactly more people coming to the table to help maintain these things. So, <laughs> on that note, I'd like to note, uh, point out that the U.S. Department of Defense uh, is a major user of, of, of FLOSS since the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, and in 2003, there was even a report that was commissioned uh, basically to determine, you know, what, like, is, is this FLOSS stuff good? Should we, you know, is it introducing problems somehow? I don't know. What's, what, what, is, what is this stuff? And uh, in that report, they found, they didn't expect to find this, but they found that uh, apparently, they depend very heavily on uh, FLOSS. And actually, the report w was basically just an argument for not banning it at the Department of Defense. You know, don't get scared, we need this. Uh, instead, they want, you know, the, the result of this report was that they should actually promote uh, more, more use of, of FLOSS at the Department of Defense. Uh, they write, uh, FLOSS applications tend to be much lower in cost than their proprietary equivalents. Uh, and yet they often provide high levels of functionality with good user acceptance. So why, why pay for something, right? Uh, so, I mean, that's, this is what scares me, is the thought that that guy who, like, rage quits, uh, rage quits uh, and is responsible for a piece of software that, like, the Department of Defense is using to, like, fire missiles with, that's also something I don't want to happen. So, I mean, these are things that we just don't, these are, these are dynamics that could, could occur and we're just not aware of them uh, even being possible. So, I, I, I think that's, that's enough with all the scary data points. Um, I, I don't want this to be about like, oh, things are all so bad, because it's not, it's not so bad. Uh, it's just that we should pay attention to this uh, and we should think more critically about how, you know, we are using open source and whether or not there's some way that we can give back to it such that we're not just extracting value and, you know, killing the people who are developing these things for us and then we all kind of lose out on the open source software that we had been using for so long, right? Um, so, with that, um, before I get into some of the things that I think, you know, we could try as solutions, uh, I'd, I'd like to just summarize. So what we really saw was, okay, this whole thing where you've got people going around being like, use open source, it's the best thing ever. Uh, that's like, they, they don't realize that that's, they already won. Like, stop telling us, yes, yes, you won. Everybody's using open source. They're not using proprietary software very much anymore. Uh, so startups, enterprise, and even governments are depending on this digital infrastructure and they're making policies to use it more and more. Uh, yet at the same time, I mean, that means that we have orders of magnitude more users and it's not like we're getting new contributors at that same rate. Uh, and, you know, what's, what's uh, stressing these contributors out is the fact that uh, people are coming from proprietary software who are used to, you know, support forums that they can yell at the poor support agent. Uh, and, you know, it's just some really stressed out guy who's working on his weekends to make this piece of software exist for us to use. So the whole, like, yelling at random people on the internet thing, it just gets worse with the open source uh, maintainers because, you know, they're already like hanging by a thread here. So, okay, what can we do to make this better? 
again, I'm just one person. Uh, I could have, you know, not the greatest ideas about this. I'm going to tell you some of the things that I at least think are, you know, better or that might work. Um, just to give you a, a sense, though, about how, so when I say funding, I, I mean both kind of time and money, because time and money are basically the same thing. Um, and it turns out, so I'm going to go through a couple of ways that people already fund open source. Um, uh, but I just would like to note um, that it's not easy. You, you know, if you have money and you want to somehow give it to a project, it's not, even, it's not even a simple thing to just be like, here, project that I love, here's $200, do something with it that, that's good. Um, you know, maybe that money should be devoted to making some feature happen or fixing a bug or something, and there might not be any maintainer that could work more hours because they might have a job already, even if you paid them, right? So it's like, it's not just that money is going to help. Um, and further, uh, sometimes the amount of money that, that people manage to get via crowdsourced means, like maybe everybody gives a dollar, you know, at, at irregular intervals, uh, might not be enough or regular enough to make a big impact, right? So it's not like, you know, just any source of money given any way is going to solve the problem. Um, that said, the, by far the most, uh, the most successful uh, way of funding open source is, is via subsidies. Uh, so we can break these into two categories. The category that everybody is probably familiar with is uh, what we call the personal labor subsidy, where you have a developer that has a day job, so you know they're not they're not completely living in a under a bridge with their laptop, opening a, uh, working on an open source project. Uh, they have a job, they are paid to do that job, and then they work on their their open source projects exclusively in their spare time. So this, this individual is, is sort of paying in time, right? In his off time or her off time. Uh, on the other side, uh, there are corporate labor subsidies, you could say. So uh, floss work that, that an employer might fund either as a side effect of a project, perhaps there's a blocker, you, you're working on some project and you need this open source library but it has a bug in it. And so, you know, you have to fix that bug because you know, you, you can't move forward with your work project if that doesn't get fixed. So uh, you could be uh, funded by an employer as a side effect of some other project, or there could even be an explicit allocation of time to some uh, FLUS project. And that is actually less frequent. I mean, it's not completely rare. It's just that's not the most common form of, of subsidizing work uh, for, you know, open source work. The, by far the most common kind is this personal labor subsidy where people are doing this in their off time, right? Um, other models that, uh, you know, have varying levels of su success uh, can be broadly lumped into the category of patronage. So even big one-off contributions to a project, let's say, you know, $10,000 or something, or small ones, uh, like small donations monthly via Patreon, uh, or even personal sponsorship for a specific project, uh, corporate patronage, like, you know, Google's like, hey, we really need op uh, OpenSSL, which, true story, they did, and then they gave them, like, uh, $100,000 or something. Several other companies got together and threw money into OpenSSL after it was realized that nobody was able to really work on it. Uh, so that's an example of this cor corporate patronage. And then there are lots of companies who uh, will build products or services around an open source project. So, uh, a project. So, you know, some commercial distribution of an open source project or... Uh, you know, assurances or contracting, hosting services, things like that. And these are all valid ways to support open source. And often, you know, there's a mixing and matching of things happening. Um, which one is the best, though? Uh, honestly, you know, so, so the, the jury is still out on this. Um, and if I had to bet any money on it, it to me, it seems like corporate, pa corporate patronage. Or, I'm sorry, uh, not corporate patronage. Why did I write that? I meant to write uh, uh, subsidies, excuse me. Corporate labor subsidies. Uh, so that's a typo on the slide. Corporate labor subsidies. So the idea that uh, you know, look at look at look at Google for for them. I mean, so V8 is okay. The reasons that V8 is open source are not relevant at the moment. Let's just look at the fact that people can see V8 being developed. People can contribute to it. Uh, I don't think that they've got any contributors outside of uh, of Google being like the truck factor people. But hypothetically, they could be right. Uh, and the fact that there are several people who are working on, on, on this project and they're paid to do it and they're paid to, to you know, come and nine to five work on this thing that a lot of people care about and depend on and need, 
uh, it's it's more sustainable than you know you working your butt off at a at a company at a startup uh, 80 hours a week and then coming home and hacking on your your tool that's you know never going to be finished because you never get the time or the energy to do it. So in my in my opinion, uh, finding ways to subsidize this work, uh, you know, as part of of you know a, a company's offering, is really the most sustainable thing. If there's something that you're making money off of that is depending on a certain project, uh, the best thing that you could do to ensure that that project still exists is contributing time or money back to that project so it does not disappear and your, your product does not disappear. Uh, so getting people who are working at your company able to be committers, able to be uh, you know, one notch up on the truck factor for that project, uh, that ensures that the thing that you're depending on doesn't go away because now uh, one of the, the truck factor people is one of your developers, um, and you know there's the the warm fuzzy feeling that this thing is not going to to, to disappear now. You can just trust that it stays there, right? Um, so in my opinion, uh, I think that the the, the sort of the best thing uh, for for open source is trying to find a way to uh, incorporate that into the time that we spend at work. Um, but this is you know th this is my like like fuzzy feeling that this is what I think should happen. Of course, uh, there are umpteen thousand problems and it, you know, it, 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 I don't even have to, it's not even about big companies versus small companies. Uh, essentially all companies don't have a, a story or process for managing open source or saying, hey, I'm gonna let my engineers work one day per month on one of the open source projects that we depend on, that we need to exist. Um, like that's a that's a, a a protocol or a process for for dealing with open source in your organization, uh, but there's you know almost none no, almost no companies have a have a have a process like this. So um, this is also this is from the the 2017 Black Duck survey, and uh, essentially what it says is that um, around 60 uh, 60 percent of of uh, of these companies that answered to this survey either have no process or the people in the company are unaware of there being a process or a story for dealing with open source contributions or open source software. Uh, and then 37 percent, there are, there, there is some indication, I mean it can be something, uh, you know, th this actually can be broken down into more fine-grained numbers, uh, but you know, the point is they've got something, they've thought about it, there's at least like a local uh, process and one department or something for dealing with this, right? Uh, so this is a problem, and I mean, I'm standing up here saying, oh yeah, yeah, we should uh, give money or time or whatever to open source projects, and of course, you know, like you work at a bank and like the, the amount of legal hoops that you would have to walk through, oh, the amount of legal hoops that you have to jump through to, uh, to be able to open source anything that you do inside of the building, uh, you know, it's, it's a hilarious proposition for me to make that, right? So every organization is different. Maybe you're part of a big one like one of the banks with many rules and processes and legal departments. Uh, or maybe you're, a, a, you know, a, you're a part of a small contracting shop and maybe it's easier for you organizationally to say, hey, you know, we, we make most of our money by uh, consulting on this one group of libraries. Perhaps one of us should become a, a committer on that library. Um, and that way, you know, it's also good for our business. And uh, you know we can use that as a way to get more jobs and whatever else. So I mean, you know, there are different sorts of organizations and different sort of you know it's 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 varying varying levels of feasibility depending on the organization, right? Um, and I can't just stand up here and say, hey, everybody, you should just do this because and it should make sense financially. Obviously, I can't, and obviously, it doesn't fit for for any organization. Um, but. Personally, I, I believe that uh, you know the floss that we use and depend on every day deserves that the, you know deserves to have this conversation happen. I mean, it should be something that should come up in, in meetings, or it should be something mentioned with clients. I think it's it's something that we're going to have to start worrying about if we don't start thinking about how we solve this problem and start how we start giving back somehow soon. Uh, you know, we're going to have big problems down the line if we don't do anything. Um, but okay, you know, this is sort of unrealistic, this suggestion, hey, like, let's go talk to our legal department or let's talk to our bosses or clients and say, how can we, how can we spend a very small number of hours per week sort of contributing back to a project that's important to our business? Uh, that's not easy. It's not gonna happen overnight. Um, so what could we do faster than needing to deal with synchronizing with the company? Another thing that I think would be 
very helpful or very useful to start is uh, actually working together and doing a better job of teaching people how to participate in open source projects. So I don't know uh, how many, I mean, I guess this, this audience, probably a lot of you participate in open source projects in some capacity. Um, but if you think back to how hard it was to get started, uh, I, I, you know, I imagine that you kind of had the experience that I had where I didn't know who to ask, I was afraid to ask people, I didn't go to the right places, I asked too detailed or not detailed enough questions. It was very difficult to get started and I didn't know the people I was talking to. Um, so we started doing this thing in the, in the Scala community, um, we call them open source sprees. And the idea is to come up with a general recipe for sort of teaching people how to uh, you know, contribute to open source projects. And this is an in-person thing. Uh, it's open to you know, anybody who works on any sort of project. It doesn't really, you don't have to be of one persuasion or another. So far, we've been doing it obviously in the context of Scala. Uh, but the idea is that you take half a day before, during, or after a conference, uh, and you get a bunch of attendees at the conference that are potentially interested in learning how to uh, you know, participate in an open source project. And then usually at a conference, there are people who are committers on a project. I'm sure there are a lot of you here who have some, some library or tool that other people care about and use. Uh, if you're interested in having somebody uh, you know, meet them face to face and perhaps somebody joins up and helps you uh, add features or fix bugs, that would be pretty cool, right? So we've been doing this in the Scala community um, at, at various conferences for the last year. And you know, we've had varying levels of success with it. Uh, but it's also something that uh, we're trying to uh, encourage people in uh, different meetup groups to pursue. So, uh, you know, I don't know uh, how many people are meetup group organizers, but there always tends to be an issue where you can't find speakers maybe, right? You, have, you go three months because you can't find somebody to give a talk on a cool project. Well, why not have a, you know, one of these open source sprees? Get together a group of people in your city and maybe there's one or two maintainers of a project and you know, everybody can learn how to contribute back to that project or you brainstorm about new things to add. Um, and uh, the way that it works is that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole structure for bringing people together to sort of make a little bit of progress on one of these projects. So uh, we always get a library author in the room or a tool author or somebody on one of the compiler teams. And that library author will curate a handful of, of to-dos. Be, they could be small uh, things that, that are good for newcomers uh, in maybe three hours of time. Uh, and the goal, the goal of the whole thing is, you know, uh, one of these newcomers will come forward and choose one of these issues that they're interested in working on in one of the libraries that are, are in the list to work on. And they ideally would like to get one PR that's associated with one of these issues merged by the end of the spree. And if they do, they get, we, we give them a, a small prize, but it's a little bit of motivation to, you know, to get to the end. Um, and we, we do this, like I said, rather regularly every couple of months. The last one we ran was in November uh, in Lyon. And um, we, I mean, the way that we do it is pretty low maintenance. We just maintain a GitHub repository with information. Uh, people, project maintainers who are going to be present at the conference will just make pull requests to this GitHub repository containing a list of the different projects and who is the person to contact about those projects. So here, uh, I mean, you know, this is the last one we had. I don't know, at least uh, 15 or so libraries uh, in, in, or not even just libraries, but tools, right? We have the, the Dottie compiler, uh, so that's the research Dottie, or the research compiler. Um, the Scala Z, which is the functional programming library. CBT, which is Chris Vogt's uh, build tool. Um, and then there are various libraries that people, people use all the time in here. Uh, and so all of these people had, they came to the, to the spree with a few ideas of things that somebody could do to help them out. And at the end of the spree, you know, there were, I don't know the number, but uh, several pull requests merged uh, for many of these projects. Um, we also provide, I'm just like, this is like scrolling down in the readme because uh, I, I don't have the internet connection right now that I need. But uh, I mean, you know, we give all kinds of instructions about how it works, how to propose projects, if you're interested in uh, sharing with people about, you know, like issues or things that you'd like to have done in your project, how to go about it. Uh, and I mean, I guess the, the t-shirts are a good indicator of how many people succeeded in uh, somehow doing something in one of the open source projects. And, um, whoops. and for us, it actually, I mean, you know, this is anecdotal, but it actually seems to have helped us, at least the projects that I have a view on, 
we've had a, a big increase in the number of casual contributors. It's not just one-off contributors, but some of these folks are coming back and saying, hey, I wanted to do this other thing. And I mean, it's something that they're maybe doing on the weekends or in their spare time. Uh, and then I think there, there actually were at least three of them who ended up uh, getting jobs by doing this. So they contributed to a number of projects that made them visible and then they went and got hired somewhere that they wanted to work and sort of improve their job situation. So it sort of, you know, it, it, it was good for us and it was good for them. Uh, and now there's also people just coming back and, and sort of helping others with issues that are, are arising in the issue trackers, et cetera. There's just a lot more activity and it's really nice. Uh, and uh, I, I argue that anybody can do it. We, all we did was come up with a social structure and we just facilitated it. And other people are sort of replicating it and it's, it's quite nice. It's also really nice to see the face behind the library that you're, you're using or interested in. Um, that's something that the internet hides from us, right? So uh, meeting the person and then uh, talking to them about what issues could be, or features or whatever could be, could be added, that, that's really neat. Um, okay, and this is the last thing I'm gonna mention and then I will, I will, I will wind down. Um, but I basically mentioned two things. I said, hey, uh, so there are all, there are all these like, ways of, of funding open source and I really think that the best thing to do is to try and find a way to have companies subsidize it. It's the most humane thing. Uh, it also just makes sense if companies are, are profiting off of it, they should find some way to sort of integrate that into how they're, you know, how they're, you know, a cost of, of, of building the tools that they're, that they're profiting off of or the, the software that they're profiting off of. That's my opinion and I don't know if this is going to go anywhere. Uh, it seems to me like the most realistic uh, solution. Um, and then I said, okay, well, if we can't really force change to happen right away, uh, all, the best we can do then, you know, us as just individuals, is we can try to help other people learn how to participate in open source. And that's, I suggest, hey, these spree things are pretty, a pretty cool way to do that. And they actually work, a little bit, at least. Not, one, you know, 100% of the people that we, we, we worked with in these sprees are not coming back all the time, but probably 15, 20% are, and that's, that's still an improvement for us, right? Um, but there's a third thing that's happening, and uh, I don't have a lot of details about it, but I'm excited about it. There's this company called Tidelift, which I, I, I only know about uh, because it was the former, like the CEO of TypeSafe for like a few months before, like right at the beginning when they were being founded, he was like the interim guy and he moved somewhere else and did things for several years. He uh, came from Red Hat. So he wasn't really, you know, a part of our community. I just knew who, was, who he was. And, uh, you know, in the last few months, he started this thing with some, some folks that I knew from the open source community in Scala called Tidelift. And they're kind of operating all secretly right now. But their mission, I'm just going to, I mean, it's extremely vague because that's what, that's what startups in stealth mode are like. But, uh, you know, their goal is basically to try and add a new model to, to sort of sustain open source. Um, and... They told me some of their ideas, uh, and I, I, you know, they're going to make some kind of announcement very soon. Um, but really what they, as far as I can understand, and I, I suggest you keep an eye on this space because it's pretty cool, they're trying to facilitate an exchange of funds relative to the usage of open source projects. So that, uh, you know, in, it's in a, you can think about it kind of like how YouTube works for people who create content. If you've got somebody who, you know, everybody is consuming uh, videos from, uh, YouTube is rewarding them. I, this is all, you know, we have issues with this, but still they get paid by, by YouTube because people are, are consuming this, right? We don't have anything like that in open source and they, they're proposing something like that, which is kind of neat because as far as I know, nobody's proposed anything like that so far. And this would ultimately be a new model for funding open source and it would mean that perhaps a developer could, you know, develop something on the weekends, maybe it takes off, becomes super popular, the whole uh, closure community depends on it. Uh, and, you know, through this weird organization, uh, they might be able to eventually quit their day job and work on this project that they kind of like hacking on on the weekends full time. They might get paid enough to do that from this, from this, uh, from this weird new model. And that's literally all the information I have about it. Uh, but you know, if, if it does what it, it promises it's going to do, this thing could be really cool. And, uh, you know, I just suggest, hey, keep an eye on it because it looks neat. And that said, I will, I will conclude. Um, and uh, I just, I really like this quote from Nadia. So um, I'm just going to read it to you as like an end note. 
Uh, in the last five years, open source infrastructure has become an essential layer of our social fabric. But much like startups or technology itself, what worked for the first 30 years of open source's history won't work moving forward. In order to maintain our pace of progress, we need to invest back into the tools that help us build bigger and better things. And with that, I'm happy to answer questions and I put up a shameless plug. If you guys like conferences, this is a cool one that I'm organizing. And those are our keynotes. You're the first people I showed the keynotes to. So uh, Alan Kay is gonna be there, Simon Payton Jones, uh, Ben Titzer, Andreas Rosberg are the guys are leading the, are, are some of the leads on the WebAssembly project. And Steve uh, Frank, Frankie, yeah, I don't know how to say his last name correctly, but he works on Go. So those are our keynotes this time. I leave that up. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Please don't roast me. Hi, uh, <laughs> thank you for the great talk. Uh, I would like to uh, know your opinion uh, on the relationship between open source. Uh, and I, I didn't hear the first part. You are what on the relationship? Uh, the relationship between open source and uh, industry or companies. Mm -hmm. If the relationship isn't uh, in a state that it is now because it somehow works. So for example, there is this potential track factor, but it never really happened. So there was no major outage or uh, problem and the, the companies don't take it seriously and uh, basically the industry models through so it works somehow so no one... Well, wasn't OpenSL cell? Wasn't that an example of it not working? Yeah, that was a... But that it was, was quickly one. fixed. That's yeah, that's either. a dramatic example. I, 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 so you're right that it, it, you know, it might be something catastrophic Rarely, um, but I mean, I don't think it's fair to say that it doesn't happen, that it's not a thing that exists. I think it does exist, and the OpenSSL example is one. If more people were working on it, there probably wouldn't have been hard bleed. Can we give the mic to the gentleman just there in the middle? There may be um, a related problem that uh, open source software is being, the production is being infiltrated by secret services to enable spying on us. Um, there are now strong rumors that secure, Apache secure drop has been compromised, so that's not really safe for whistleblowers to use it. And I just uh, Googled on Heartbleed and open SSL in combination with the CIA, and what do I read? Uh, NSA knew of Heartbeat already two years. And they probably liked it. Is that, sorry? <laughs> and they probably liked it too. Yes. Didn't they? Uh, and <laughs> this Steve guy, Steve. Um, Hen uh, Marcus and Marcus, Steve yes. So uh, what I found is Steve Marcus was a former CIA consultant. Yeah, he, worked, well, he was a government. So I know he was a government contractor. Whether or not there was something dubious behind his involvement in OpenSSL, I can't say. We could speculate. But uh, I know he was yeah. a government contractor. That's all I know. So if he was like, you know, a secret CIA agent, like ensuring that wasn't broken or that wasn't fixed, I don't know. Like I. But um, can we do anything to make sure that the, all these back doors that have been planted get out of it? And, uh... So, I mean, I have a much more modest proposal, which is maybe we should have more eyes looking at this stuff. Yes, yes. And it, more <laughs> eyes looking at this is like, sorry, it's like you, you guys in this room, uh, you should look at the stuff you're using. I don't know, maybe you know, you'll find something scary that Andre, you know, was worried about. I don't know. There's just not enough people looking at these things and, I don't know, considering can this be improved, should this be fixed, we just kind of treat it like it's somebody else's problem and then we complain when it doesn't work. I'm suggesting that we should be a little more proactive as a group of people who depend on this stuff. But shouldn't there also be a kind of laws for that, that say that states shouldn't interfere with this and that oh. says outlaw uh, this... You know, we, we, could, we could make laws, but you know, you know who's like, you know, when do governments agree on following laws? Like, they don't exactly, they ignore each other, they break laws all the time. I'm not sure that, especially the U.S. government would probably yeah. make a rule and break it secretly. So, I mean, sure, we could do that. I'm not sure how useful that would be. <laughs> I wouldn't know either, but thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so I think we have time for two more questions. 
I've got one down here. Okay. Uh, first, uh, you describe the open source industry as being powered by a few enthusiastic, burned out individuals and exploited by lots of greedy companies. Uh, well, it was kind of, well, to simplify things a bit, okay. it was kind of depressing, but then you said that 37% of companies, in one way or another, have a process of contributing yep. back. So Which it's actually it's wonderful. It's ne nearly too good to be true. It's unbelievable good news. Unbelievably good news. And uh, the other thing is, um, sorry, I forgot my next question. <laughs> well, I mean, you're right. It's not all bad. It's, I mean, ah, sorry, yes. Uh, it, you it, mentioned the way to support open source by business. As, uh, you labeled it products and services. So there are companies that, that actually that. make money on writing and supporting. Yep. Yeah, I happen to be working for one of them. Yep. And my question is, do you have any indication how important it is, like industry-wide? How, how, how important a part does this business model play in supporting open source industry? So I am, I am an imperfect person with a limited view of a few examples. Um, I've seen very successful ones where it seems to be working really well and everybody downstream is super happy and I've seen examples where people are not happy with the company. Uh, so, I mean, you know, <laughs> I could name several NoSQL databases, <laughs> for example. Um, but there are examples where it's worked and where it hasn't. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not confident to say, like, this is a model that works well because clearly there's something that, you know, we're doing wrong in some and right in others. And I don't know, maybe the businesses are not making money and then they're, like, decimating the open source. I don't know. It's a very complicated system that I cannot make any worthwhile observations about. I just know it works sometimes and that doesn't work other times. Um, yeah, so there's nothing I can say about that. But on the other point, I just want to, I, I, yeah, I agree with you that like I started with this, I, I even started the whole presentation. I'm like, yeah, this sounds really bad. And then, oh, 37%, that's good, right? It's definitely very good. And, uh, you know, there are some surveys that show that 50% of companies, usually who are following in open source, whatever interest things, they'll have 50% of their, depending on the, the set of users you, you ask to answer the survey, 50% of people are contributing back to open source. You ask a different set of people, it's like 2%, right? But I mean, it's not horrible. People are contributing back. It's not like, you know, I guess what I, I really want you to walk away with are that things that you care about or that you use or depend on uh, are, are, are better and better supported by, by, by some companies or some organizations and less well supported by others. And then you have like the problem where there's one person on it who could be all stressed out and quit, right? Uh, and you don't want that to happen. So there's, it's, not, it's not homogeneous like across all of these different projects. They're not all well supported. Some are really not well supported. And we should just be aware that that's a reality for some projects that we actually use day to day. Oh. That was a very nice talk, and you're drawing attention, I think, to something that's important and that wasn't on my radar, so I'm very grateful. Um, just a couple of anecdotal stories that things aren't all negative. You'll know that Jane Street makes heavy use of OCaml and yep. then puts a lot back into the OCaml community. Oh, yeah. That's one of the things they see as their need. I first met Charles Hoskins, the CEO of um, IOHK, which uses Haskell for their cryptocurrency stuff. He wanted to meet me to say, okay, how do we put back into the Haskell community. Yep. So there are definitely people there are aware definitely, of this. Yeah, there are tons of, 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 of good things to note. I mean, we have a lot of also good stories in the Scala community. So it's not just like, hey, the Scala Center is funded by X companies, but choose a, a library or a group of libraries and you'll have companies directly funding the development of those or supporting their user groups and whatnot. So we've got a lot of that in the Scala community too, which is really cool. And I, you know, again, I, I, I'm sorry if I scared you with like the overwhelmingly negative <laughs> title. But yeah, I mean, if you care about pandas, for example, we should be worried about Python pandas because there's, what, two, two developers keeping it alive. I mean, Scala is good. Haskell's pretty good. Uh, we saw that uh, Linux is amazing, apparently. But uh, there are other things that don't have such great stories behind them. And right. I, I don't so know. We should be concerned about those. It's worth keeping track of. One thing I want to ask you about is in the early days of open source, people said this will be sustained by um, an ecosystem of companies that are maintaining this stuff and getting consulting fees for it. And you've sort of touched on that here or there, but that used to be the main story. So how healthy 
is that part so of that, the world. So that's exactly the kind of, you know, you work at one of these companies, I don't know which one, but there are a lot of those. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they do support, the, I mean, it really, it's, I, again, I, I don't feel confident saying that it works or it doesn't work because I have a box of examples where it doesn't work and a box of examples where it does. In, in one case, you've got these companies completely destroying the project that they are making money off of. In the other case, they are profiting and the project is growing and it's great. Uh, and why that's happening for, I mean, it could be, you know, the, the project itself that's, you know, poorly targeted, the business model is bad, there's lots of reasons for these things. But this is indeed true for a number of open source projects, but it's also not true for others. Why? I don't know, you should hire a business guy to figure that out. But, uh, but yes, I think it works, but not always. Anyhow, thank you for putting it on my radar, and I'm sure there'll be an interesting conversation about this going forward. Yep, thanks, Bill. Um, so thank you, Heather. I think this is something that um, is sort of resonates uh, viscerally with at least a few of us in the audience and probably um, the rest of us to a lesser or greater extent. We have lightning talks in 10 minutes at 6 o'clock. Please help me um, give Heather a closing round of applause. Thank you.